Can you imagine building a real estate portfolio worth $2.7 billion in just 10 years? Well, our guest today has done just that, and I'm proud to say I knew him when. You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. I'm Kathy Fetke. Welcome to The Real Well Show. Our guest today is Joe Fairless. He is the co-founder of Ashcroft Capital, which has over $2.7 billion of assets under management. He's also the host of the Best Ever Real Estate Investing Advice Ever podcast and author of Best Ever Apartment Syndication book. He and his lovely wife created Best Ever Causes, which has proudly supported 69 different nonprofits over the last 65 months. And he's here with us today on The Real Well Show to give us some best ever advice. Joe, welcome back to The Real Well Show. Yeah, looking forward to our conversation. It's been a little while since we've caught up on on your show and excited to. It's been a little while and catching up with you is really fun because, wow, look at look at you. Look at where you've come. So you were a landscaper. Now you run a $2.7 billion multifamily fund. Did I get that right? A half of it right. I, I wasn't ever a landscaper. You don't want me messing with your shrubs. Why um, does she have that in here? Uh, that's fine, though. You know You know what, though? I actually, I had J&J lawns with my buddy Jeff in high school, which okay. I don't think I've ever told anyone that. But you know what? Your, your point person... Maybe they were doing the best research anyone's ever done. So yes, we we did have J and J lawns my junior year of high school, and someone stiffed us on a payment. And then my my friend's uh, sister, who was in law school at the time, was clerking at a law firm, and she wrote a very official looking letter like, "You need to pay these guys the two hundred dollars because I got stung by bees uh, on that on that lawn, um, and it was overgrown." And uh, after that summer, though. There was no more J&J lawns. I realized that I wasn't cut out for that business. All right. Well, kudos to my uh, producer <laughs> for finding that. I, I, think I may be the only podcast that has announced this. Okay. So when did you decide to go? I, I believe you were studying marketing in New York um, and then pivoted yeah, to uh, real yeah. estate. Uh, so I, I, was, I graduated from Texas Tech with an advertising degree, and then I moved to New York City. Uh, exactly. Right out of college, worked in at, at advertising agencies, made $30,000 as my first full-time job as a junior project manager at a company called Shiat Day. And it's an Omnicom agency for anyone in that space. And then I climbed the corporate ladder relatively quickly and started, uh, once I had money to invest, uh, I saved up my first $20,000 and bought my first single family house in Duncanville, Texas in 2009. It was, <laughs> I saved up 20K, bought it for $76,000. Wow. Now, how do you save $20,000 when you're living in New York City? That's hard to do. Yeah, well, it is. And my friends didn't. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's hard to do, especially when you start out making 30K a year and your rent's seven fifty dollars a month <laughs> and you have about, about $18,000 and change worth of student loan debt. I kept my, what I realized is that uh, what, where I was at that time was not where I wanted to be. So I uh, lived in East Flatbush, Brooklyn for a year, right out of college. I was in 2005 and then I moved to the East Village. But in the East Village, I lived there for nine years, but it was always with a roommate. And most of the time it was with a roommate from Craigslist. It was in a two bedroom apartment. <laughs> It uh, did not have a living room. It had a hallway, two bedrooms. One of the bedrooms didn't have AC, didn't even have a window. Well, n- n- the, the apartment did not have AC, but one of the bedrooms didn't have a window. <laughs> and uh, then it was a bathroom and that was it, uh, a dorm style refrigerator. And my friends would make fun of me because they would all be upgrading to a studio apartment in Manhattan and I was still living with my new Craigslist roommate. Uh, they you know, turn over every couple of years. And uh, they were getting one bedroom apartment, studio apartments. And I was living like a college kid with a dorm style fridge and no living room for nine years in that apartment. 
But what I was doing is I was tucking the money away and I was eventually saving enough money to buy my first house investment property. And, you know, that turned out to be the right, the right choice to delay that gratification. Oh, so many people complain today that uh, we had it better and specifically my generation. But uh, I think a lot of people are saying it's never been so hard to get into real estate as it is today. And yet, you know, I'm listening to you. It's, I'm always saying, you know, it's never been easy. It always takes yeah. sacrifice. I did the same thing. I, I rented out every room I could in the house that Rich and I first bought, whether he liked it or not. I was like, no, yeah. we. I'm still doing it. I'm still house hacking today. We still have a property on our property that I put on Airbnb for that extra income. So there's, yeah. to me, there's, it always takes sacrifice, but good there's for you. And there's always going to be an excuse yeah, there's always going to be a challenge, you know, right now, uh, if you're looking to get in the industry or if you're looking to grow, the challenge is there's not deal flow. But a couple years ago, the challenge was, well, how do I raise the money for the deals? Uh, turns out you shouldn't have been buying a couple years ago. Uh, I was guilty of that. And, you know, we're, we're working through what we purchased at the peak of the market, um, hindsight 2020, but there, there's always going to be a challenge. And, you know, I, I remember someone, a uh, Chris Urso, that's, uh, I, I was talking to someone the other day. I couldn't remember his name, Chris Urso. I, he was, uh, he has a syndication company and he hosted classes of, uh, for people in Long Island and I was living in New York city. So I traveled to one or two of his classes whenever I was just you know, learning about the business one of the things he said is you either live in a deal market or a money market. Mm -hmm. And you know, people in New York City, for example, complain that there's no deals around them, but holy cow, you're bound around a bunch of rich people. And people in Cincinnati might say the opposite. There's no money, but I see some deals. And the takeaway is that there's always going to be a challenge, uh, regardless of what part of the cycle we're in, where we live, what age we are, our family situation. And you know, one of the books that uh, resonates with me is uh, the Road to Character. And in the book, uh, they they talk about you know different people who have who have uh, are not perfect by any means, but they are uh, people who have um, worked through their challenges, and they've actually gotten to a place where they've evolved such that they, and this is the key, they pursue challenges. They don't react to challenges. They don't just embrace challenges. I think, I think there's different levels of our evolution mentally. It's, do we react to a challenge? Okay, that's natural instinct. Um, do we work through the challenge and treat it as a gift? Awesome. You're, 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 you're pretty good on the, the, mental, the mental aspect. But eventually, can we get to the point where we actually pursue the challenges? Because we know when we pursue challenges, we're, we're essentially pursuing growth and we're essentially pursuing fulfillment and progress. And that's, that's where that, that's the simple minds or the simple comment that someone might have of, yeah, it was easier back then. Well, it's a, we, in order to be successful and to be fulfilled, we need to pursue challenges. So if you think it's harder now, congratulations, that's a good thing for you. And it's not, but keep with that mindset because you're actually going to have more development uh, than if it wasn't hard, if it wasn't challenging. And like you said, it's just a different kind of challenge, real estate cycles. So, um, you know, just like you said, a couple of years ago, you were fighting off competitors, you know, there were a hundred people making an offer on the one property you want. And if you, if you made the, the right offer, you wouldn't get the deal. Right. Mm -hmm. So you had to kind of right. go over asking price. We don't really have that today. So in my opinion, it's easier today uh, to find the deal because you have less competition, mm -hmm. still competition, and there's still limited inventory, but a, a, a lot of players are out of the game. So let's, let's talk about that. Uh, there's so much I want to say uh, about where you started and where you are today. Uh, but let's, let's start with today because you have built this massive portfolio. I have watched you grow phenomenally. I think we had a conversation when you were just starting and you were asking some questions about, about 
how to do a podcast or whatever. I don't know if sure, you do remember absolutely. that. Absolutely, I absolutely do. Absolutely. <laughs> and then, and then you went, you know, did it, and your podcast, you know, moved to number one. It's just been phenomenal. And and then you started building, you know, investing in multifamily and doing syndications and then funds to the point of two point eight billion and way surpassed anything I've ever done, which I thought I had done a lot. So here you are, ten years later, or is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 12 since About the 12. first apartment community, 12, uh, what, what year are we in 2024? 11, <laughs> 11 years later from the first apartment community. And, uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. more from the, more from the first single family home, but we'll just count it from the apartment community. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. So now that you have this big portfolio and you're looking back, you have an enormous amount of experience. Now you're the one giving advice, uh, what advice would you give your younger self? Um, uh, well, one piece would be to attempt to identify the risks in from every angle for each transaction. And specifically, one thing that comes to mind is uh, if you do floating rates, than buying a rate cap for the entire term of the loan. So if it's a five-year loan, buy it for five years. Uh, one mistake, uh, I guess it was a mistake that we made, I, I wouldn't do it again, so we'll call it a mistake, is that for a five-year loan, for some of the properties that we purchased, we bought a three-year rate cap, which is great. You, you, you need a rate cap, uh, but ideally it would be for the whole period of time. That way you don't have to renew um, in case they decide to do a historic, in, you know, increase in in interest rates again, uh, that way you're you're covered. Uh, that's what's that's that's one tactical thing that comes to mind. Um, and then I'd say telling telling also you know my my younger self that um, depends on how young how how young is my younger self by the way. <laughs> and any any age that's younger than today. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, well, yeah, we'll we'll go with we'll go with right out of college. Uh, right out of college, what I would do is I would start the podcast right out of college instead of in my however old I was, early thirties mm-hmm. uh, or late twenties. I don't remember. And the reason why is because as as I know you've experienced, you build friendships through the podcast. You gain you you build a platform that is your platform and that you can control and you're not reliant upon um, a Facebook algorithm uh, that may or may not change and completely wipe away your community. You're simply reliant upon your voice and the relationships that, that you um, establish with the guests and the, the interviews that you choose to host. And uh, ultimately, what that would allow me to do, though, I've mentioned some secondary benefits. The primary benefit is that by starting right out of college, I would have been uh, learning that much faster. The primary benefit of hosting a podcast is to ask the questions that we want to ask selfishly and to learn the answers and to get better at what we do. And by starting a decade or so earlier than I did, I mean, I'd be that much farther along because of what I would have learned and then the relationships I would have created and and, uh, the benefits that come from that. Oh my gosh, it's so true. The people that I have met because of my radio show and my podcast and the the things I learned, I mean, that's exactly how it was when I started is I was just absorbing information, getting to almost feel like I'm having lunch with this celebrity, with this person who knows so much and and ask Mm -hmm. questions that you know, maybe don't show up in the book. Yeah. Uh, so great yeah. advice. Okay. So going back to rate caps uh, for the audience that is not familiar with that, uh, with multifamily, uh, your rate adjusts. It's generally an adjustable rate. And because rates were so low and the threat that they would go up was was imminent, uh, people would buy the rate cap, which means that if the interest rate went up, um, it would be covered by insurance. Did I sum that up properly? Sure. Yep. For for the time yeah. that you buy it. But if it runs out and so you've got a five year note, but a three year rate cap, all of a sudden now your rate has jumped. You have to buy a new rate cap. 
And that has been so challenging to people in commercial real estate because mm -hmm. the payment, I mean, that maybe it was a hundred thousand or 10,000 and then all of a sudden it's a hundred thousand or even higher. I mean, th 30, 30,000 jumps to like 1.2 million in some and, cases. At, at and you're not expecting that, you know? Correct. S so super tough. And then at the same time, we have inflation, massive inflation, much better today. But just because inflation is coming down doesn't mean prices have come down. It just means that the speed of inflation is coming down. So if if a lot of these costs went up, they're just going up a little bit more slowly now, but they're still up. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got increased costs and then insurance is a nightmare. So sitting here today, I mean, how do you overcome these challenges? Like we talked about in the beginning of the show, these are unprecedented challenges. Yeah. Well, we focus on what we can control. A lot of the things that uh, you mentioned, we cannot control. Uh, we could control it if we made a different decision going into the deal. But at this point, you can't control certain aspects of the deal. So then we ask ourselves, what can we control? And how do we make progress on that daily? That's it. Uh, so I'll give you a specific example. Uh, what we realized we could control is the uh, renovation costs. Uh you know, there just some people with you know, with their apartment community. They they go to Home Depot get the supplies. It's convenient, but it's really expensive. Uh, other people uh, get a little bit cheaper. They get HD supply, uh, less expensive than a, going straight to Home Depot. A um, little bit longer lead time, but you know, less expensive. Other people might work with a property management company, and that property management company um, has the um, buying power of many. Uh, 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 they buy a lot of buy, they buy a lot of materials. Therefore, they can get negotiate cheaper pricing. Um, so that's another level down. What we do is, in my opinion, the cheapest uh, way you can do it, but with high quality stuff. And that is, we buy directly from the supplier. We ship it directly from overseas to our warehouse in Dallas, and then we have a mini Amazon, and we kit the renovation materials, the renovation supplies, and we package them up and we, we send them out to each of our properties for renovation. We save on average 35% compared to if we were to buy it retail at Home Depot. Not only that, but we get customized, high quality, higher quality, in my opinion, items. Um, you know, and, and we're very intentional about uh, what, what we offer uh, our residents and the different upgrade packages. So, you know, that is, that is one thing that has come out of these challenges is that, you know, there's, there are some challenges that, yeah, they're really challenging, but we can't control it. So let's focus on what matters and what we can control and, and let's work on that. And then eventually, you know, things are cyclical, right? There's seasons and the season will change. Uh, winter is here. Spring will come. And when spring comes, what we will have is a better way to renovate our 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 apartment communities um, in the now and in the future. That's here to stay. And so that that's that's how we think about. It. That's what we look at. What are some ways that we can control the costs, income, and expenses, and have that not only for today but for tomorrow when it's a different season. Yeah, I love that. Uh, challenges do force you to do things differently. And then those things stick and you get to use them to be even better in the future. Yep. Um, so I love that. So are you currently in acquisition mode or like you said, just kind of working on the projects you currently have? We are in acquisition mode. Absolutely. Uh, the challenge is that there's, uh, you know, there are there aren't a lot of sellers, mm -hmm. and when they do decide to sell, there is um, about a fifteen percent price gap uh, between what buyers will pay and what sellers will take. And so, you know, we haven't bought anything in um, you know, six months or so. Uh, we were just in Best and Final on a really nice property in Atlanta, 
150,000 median income within a couple miles. And uh, we did not get the deal. Uh, we were um, beat out by a million dollars from an institution. And, you know, uh, that's okay, obviously. Uh, that's mm -hmm. okay because we went in with our best price uh, for what made sense for our investors and us and didn't get it. Uh, we are actively looking uh, and, and you know, we will buy uh, when the time is right, when we find the right property. Yeah, when because yeah, you can't. This, I think this is a big problem that a lot of people uh, face or they're facing now is getting a little bit mm, push, pushing the buy box out a little like, OK, yeah. like in the case of this institutional fund, they've got maybe an extra million and maybe they don't need the, they have different metrics for the returns mm -hmm. that they need or they yep. maybe have economies of scale or for some reason they are able to pay that extra million. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't work for you guys. But did you notice after? Uh, over the past few years that people would sort of push the limit of what they could actually make work? Um, I don't know because I don't know how they're running their numbers and what they were, you know, wh wh what if, what if at all there was a sliding scale on their end? Cause I wasn't, you know, part of their conversations. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. I assume, I assume so, but cause things got frothy, but I don't know. Yeah. But it sounds like um, you're not seeing too much of a bloodbath out there in, in multifamily or no. in commercial real estate if people are reluctant to lower their prices. No, uh, not at all. Uh, we're, mm -hmm. we're not. Uh, that could change. But I mean, how long have we been saying that could change? Yeah. You know, this time last year, I was saying that could change. I, I, I thought that when, this time last year, I thought that... Uh, if, uh, things would open up and there'd be some really distressed sellers in the fall of 2023 that didn't happen um, by and large uh, that, you know, uh, th there are certain, certain, um, you know, certain deals that show up every now and then, but um, industry wide, it's not, it's not happening uh, at least not right now. Um, you know, keep interest rates the way, the way they are or, increase them uh, for, you know, and then see what happens in six to 12 months, then you'll, you'll probably get it. Who knows though? I, uh, I've, yeah. I've been wrong on my crystal ball many times. <laughs> uh, so that's why we focus on what we can control and, yeah. and uh, do the best with uh, the, the third party research companies that we uh, pay. And also, you know, our team that has, you know, a lot more expertise in, in the industry and decades of experience in their niche. Yeah, it's uh, it's either the banks are working with people, or you know something's happening, or there's just enough institutional money that they're coming in and maybe I, coming in as yeah. private equity. But there's enough you know, money out there. There's not to stress. Neil Bawa did a really good presentation, uh, which you know, obviously, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, he did a good presentation. He did, but his presentation was on the at my conference last week, and his presentation was on banks that are in trouble. Uh, you know, local banks, about 280 or so that are in trouble. And he doesn't, he, his, his, um, his takeaway was that it's not a systemic issue. It's not, not going to be a, a snowball effect, but he, what he did say, what I, in addition to that, what he said, which, which I thought was interesting is that um, banks are generally not working out multifamily loans. They'll just take them back because banks see the value of multifamily and they'll just mm -hmm. turn around and sell compared mm -hmm. to office uh, as an extreme example, uh, they will not foreclose generally on office because they don't want it back. They'll yeah. do a workout and they'll try and kick the can down the road with, with the operator. And so what's that tell us? Well, it's good and bad for multifamily operators. It's good that uh, banks also see the value, the the short, medium, and long term value of multifamily, uh, that the the values have um, you know held strong, decreased about fifteen percent, depending on the asset, the property type or the, the 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 vintage, I should say, but still held strong compared to the other asset classes. Um, uh, but the downside is that if you have a loan that's due and you are in a challenging spot. 
well, the bank will just take it right back because they, they actually don't mind taking it back. Um, and, you know, fortunately we're not in, you know, any, posi- in any of those positions where we have loans due at a, at an inopportune time. And, and, but I do know people who have gone through that and, um, you know, they'll, they'll get pref equity and, and, uh, or they'll uh, do a capital call or both, um, or they'll, the bank will, will take the loan, um, or take the property back. And so, yeah, we're not, we're not seeing, uh, a lot of motivated sellers, uh, and workouts because, you know, banks are okay t- taking it back and, uh, the valuations haven't decreased as much as what, uh, people might anticipate. And I think the writing's on the wall for anyone wanting to look at that wall that in two, two to three years, multifamily is going to swing the other way because of the lack of new construction that will be coming to the market in two to three years. Right now, multifamily is fighting multiple headwinds, but in two to three years, uh, right now, uh, let's say right now there's no new construction penciling. And so in two to three years, you'll see that as a result of of you know no new supply, relatively speaking, coming to the market. So the if you're an owner in two to three years of multifamily, you're going to be in a desirable position. Yeah, you have John Chang uh, from Marcus and Millchap at your event too every year, or at least for the last few, and he's just full of data. I think one of the things he said is there's he he they're estimating three and a half million uh, units that are needed that are not. That you know, just the in terms of the lack of housing. Yeah. So this problem is not behind us, and you know, yeah, you're right. There's there's some s- struggle out there, but you get through it. Um, there's there's hope on the other side, and then of course we're in home new home construction to h- kind of help solve that problem as well. Yeah, it's a good business to be in. Yeah, yeah. Except for when there's challenges, like uh, when you know all of our subdivisions went through COVID and sometimes yeah. the, the city was shut down and we couldn't get the permits or it would take, you know, six extra months to get them. Then we couldn't get the supplies. We, we probably went through this too, couldn't get the materials. And if you could, they were 10 times what you had budgeted. Yeah. So definitely um, the higher priced, the, the Utah Park City development we have just has been very challenged because mm-hmm. it's already a super high priced market with interest rates. It's just kind of harder to sell those properties. Plus, they were more expensive. Yeah. And I don't know if this happens to you because I don't know if you're building ground up. But in Park City, we had to do 30% affordable housing. Mm. And there was a set amount. We could only sell those units for $450,000. Where Now, with all these added costs, it costs us $800,000 to build them. But we're the county's yeah. requiring us to sell it as affordable. So that we're just pencil. taking those. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. So ground up yeah. development. Yeah. It's got its challenges for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Joe. Okay. Well, any last tips for our listeners who are wondering if there's a huge recession coming and they should just sit and wait it out or if now is the time to jump in? I don't know if there's a huge recession. I don't know if there's a recession coming or not. What I, what I do know is that consumer debt's through the roof. Uh, people are, you know, credit card balances and uh, auto loans. I mean, they they are incredibly high relative to historical standards. However, people are right now out earning their debt. They're they're just making more money and they're outrunning the amount of debt that's 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 piling up. Uh, so, if they maintain employment. If the unemployment level stays you know below four percent or I don't know what the magic number is to then just say, "Hold up, people aren't employed, and now all that debt that they've been piling up they, they, they've got to come to come to terms with that because mm-hmm. they they are no longer out earning this debt uh, because that's what's happening right now uh, so if something shakes up in the unemployment or in the employment market if if something happens, I don't know what it would be but uh, there's a lot of debt that pe- that individuals have, and if that takes place, then th- there's going to be something uh, negative in the economy uh, because mm-hmm. it's not sustainable unless people are continuing to earn more than the debt that they keep accumulating. Pay off that debt. Oh man, sometimes those credit cards are twenty, thirty percent interest rates. Oh, just pay it off. 
All right, Joe. Well, it is always a pleasure to have you on The Real Well Show and also to attend your event, the Best Ever Conference. Tickets are on sale for next year at a very affordable pr price. So get out there, get those tickets because you will be surrounded by some of the best of the best in the industry and, and get real real time information and connections. Thanks. All right, Joe. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and I hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Well Show. We have our upcoming live event scheduled for May 4th. You can find out more about that by going to realwealthshow.com. It will be in San Francisco. I will be giving my housing forecast. I'll also be talking a little bit about our latest syndications. And we have six property teams coming to join us to tell us about their markets and how they're finding deals for our members at Real Wealth and able to negotiate some really incredible interest rates on those by negotiating with builders. In fact, some are under 5%. So get them while they last. I'm Kathy Fetke. Hope to see you there at our live event. Again, you can go to realwealthshow.com for details. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.